All right, so we're back. We're recording this right after the last episode because I know Scott, you are you are traveling in a couple of weeks, so mm-hmm. we won't be able to touch base with you back then. Mm-hmm. Uh, so next topic, this topic I want I wanted to ask you about is regarding the um, the interesting article that you had published on Forbes.com. Congratulations mm-hmm. on that. That's pretty thank you. Pretty darn cool, by the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, you mentioned it was it was about. And if you're watching this, make sure to go check out that article and, and get a little bit of background after this uh, mm-hmm. video. Is uh, you're talking about um, uh, addressing the the opportunities now and post pandemic, and mm-hmm. the fact that both um, well, at least you mentioned Bill Gates, but I know that also Warren mm-hmm. Buffett had mm-hmm. entered the self storage space mm-hmm. last year in 2020. Mm-hmm. Now, considering mm-hmm. that at the time of this recording, it looks like the next stimulus package of 1.9 trillion it's Mm -hmm. an insurmountable unimaginable amount looks like it's going to get pushed through and Mm -hmm. there's like thousand dollar up to maybe fourteen hundred dollar individual stimulus checks Mm -hmm. uh, being sent out to individuals how how do you think all this stuff comes together and what do you think that's gonna affect that might have if any uh in the short medium term for self-storage Wow. Okay. So, uh, you know, in the macro sense, if we're talking about, uh, you know, the economy and the market in general, um, you know, we could go a lot of different ways with this for well, as you know. So yeah. let's um, perhaps catch everybody up to speed as to where we're at from the end of 2020. And that is, um, yeah, in the beginning of the pandemic, self-storage benefited uh, greatly. Um, and again, we don't celebrate pandemics. We don't celebrate recessions, but we, we benefit. So this industry benefits uh, greatly when we have those occurrences. Uh, fortunately, we haven't had many um, pandemics and we've had to navigate through this one, but what happened and what happens uh, during those times is that, you know, we saw an awful lot of businesses shut down immediately. They put their inventory and they put their things in into storage and that caused a huge ramp up in demand. Uh, we saw an awful lot of folks going home and uh, working from home and that meant they had to clean out a bedroom, they had to clean out uh, the, the living room or some space for at least one, if not um, sometimes two Uh, workers that came back, you know, mom and dad came back home to work and they had to clear out some space. Uh, The colleges were shut down. Uh, Everybody put their their items in in storage for an indefinite amount of time. We didn't know uh, what colleges were going to go back or not. And so that caused a huge demand for storage again. All the while, the banks, you know, hit the pause button for three or four months on on speculative type projects, meaning development, um, and then included self-storage. So we had this uh, backlog while we have a huge demand and uh, a a blip in the supply chain. And so all of that is favorable to self-storage. So fast forward to now, you know, we're recording this in February and we're still in that place. And some states have opened up more, some states have closed back down again, as we call it a second wave. Um, Whatever that looks like just depends upon the governor, depends upon, you know, what is happening, you know, in a particular state or in a market at the time. Uh, But things have largely stayed the same. We haven't seen this uh, huge turnaround. Um, So in terms of the stimulus, I, I, to be honest with you, Roel, I don't know that that affects us that much. Um, all, I, all I can see is that it's just a Band-Aid for a bigger problem. And that is, you know, we're, we're in or heading towards a massive recession again. Our country is printing money um, like crazy. There are businesses uh-huh. that have not opened up. The folks that could hold on, they were holding on by, you know, a thread. And so, you know, many companies are still struggling through uh, the pandemic and the economics of that. And there, there are more layoffs and there are more jobless claims and there are businesses closing down. And anytime we have trauma and transition in our in our economy, that creates a, a demand and a need for storage. So we will begin to see the less and less of the free money out there, even if it's just a small check of fourteen hundred dollars or a thousand dollars. But also those uh, moratoriums on evictions at the apartments, you know, those are burning off now. You know, all of the other programs that were put in place um, in both the private and the public sector. You know, those are all going away. Um, and so at, at that point, people will begin to, you know, give up their apartments, move back in with each other, move in with uh, mom and dad. And uh, that is going to cause a need for storage um, yet again. Same with businesses, more businesses that close that'll create uh, more of a demand for storage. Um, the good news is um, for us in the, in the industry is that this is the time that we, this is my third recession. And so, you know, each and every time, I mean, history does re- repeat itself uh, to a degree. We know that self-storage benefits um, but this time around, what we've got that's a little bit differently than the last three, re- three recessions is that, you know, we see that banks, um, they, they've looked at self-storage. It's got a track record of doing extremely well and being very, very recession resistant. So instead of 
turning off the development uh, faucet uh, or closing the, the purse strings, um, they are opening them up and they these banks are strengthening their balance sheet by offering loans on self-storage development and existing facilities or conversions that we talked about um, in our last episode because they know that self-storage does extremely well. And so if the bank wants to stay in business or wants to continue to put money into play in the market, self-storage is one of the safest bets in order for them to do so because there is so much uh, demand and still pent-up demand and more coming as we head into the recession. So I, I think we can go a lot of um, different directions and, um, and look at many different angles. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I think the stimulus check is, is, is all just a conversation piece uh, leading up to what is the greater problem that is coming and that is uh, the looming recession. And, and the question is, you know, how, how big, how deep, how long um, and that is going to determine how well self-storage uh, does. We, we, we know what happens and we've been preparing for it. We know what's coming. We just don't know exactly when and how long it's going to last. Mm -hmm. So you think the, um, the stimulus uh, checks going to the individuals may be just a bit of kicking the can down the road and delaying the inevitable? I, I believe so. Fourteen hundred dollars doesn't uh, change, um, you know, too much for folks that have uh, lost a job. You know, that may be, you know, half of uh, a month's income, and if they still can't find a job, you know, that's uh, that's it. It may have helped a little bit, but it doesn't really stave off the bigger problems that people are facing right now. And uh, I think the greater problem that it creates is uh, the one that it does um, to, you know, the overall debt structure of this country, and that just trickles back down and by way of higher taxes or somebody having to pay and figure out um, how to pay that off at some point, rather than just letting the market figure it out and do what it does best. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I kind of agree that it, with it's, it's a bit of a, a Band-Aid solution and then mm -hmm. kicking the can down the road a little bit. Uh, what worries me is that it, <clears throat> the economy, uh, at least in North America, Canada, US, um, mm -hmm. all westernized countries are really dependent upon um, easing quantity of printing of money. Yes. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, so let's say that that is a likely outcome uh, mm -hmm. that that we're kind of delaying the inevitable. And at, at some point, mm -hmm. the economy these need to kind of digest and there's mm -hmm. a bit more trauma and transition, which mm -hmm. bodes well for for self storage um, mm -hmm. operators. So it's mm -hmm. kind of like we're putting ourselves in the path of of the trend, and mm -hmm. the, the rest of the economy will come to us. The mm -hmm. question about as well on the flip side with people like Warren Buffett, um, Bill Gates mm -hmm. getting into it, mm -hmm. should that be a cause for concern for like us in this mid-level, you know, many in our community have one, two, three, mm -hmm. maybe uh, up to 10 facilities in their portfolios. So they're not the single family run businesses mm -hmm. and they're not, they're not competing directly with the REITs, but mm -hmm. is there a concern that, that the REITs are starting to gobble up some of that um, supply? Well, I see uh, what what has been created recently is, uh, you know, we've had the REITs around, uh, which are the larger players, uh, the real estate investment trusts, for those that uh, that may be uh, new to that term. It's the public storage, uh, the life storage, uh, CubeSmart, um, the big folks, uh, you know, the three-story gleaming facilities in the major metropolitan statistical areas that have, you know, access to unlimited amounts of money and, and can buy and buy and buy. Well, there, I, I can't say that it is a, a direct competition to those of us getting into the business. Um, but what it has created is, um, again, we've seen a, a lot of awareness of how well self-storage does during a recession and just as a, as a sector of our economy period. So yes, um, that made news when Bill Gates uh, begins to invest a significant amount into self-storage and so does Warren Buffett and Blackstone's purchase, a $1.2 billion purchase of Simply. So, you know, when the biggest hedge funds in the country are placing, you know, uh, large amounts of eggs into the self-storage basket, it has the attention of a whole lot of folks. Um, I know uh, on our end, um, our, our private equity investors, uh, the list is growing. The list of inquiries to invest in our project is growing um, as they're exiting Wall Street and they're putting their 401k dollars uh, to work or even just um, cash to work. Um, they're plowing in into self-storage and um, our phones are ringing quite frequently um, for people looking to invest in our in our storage uh, projects. So what that does is that um, then it creates and it has created um, a mid-REIT, as we call it. And that's a term that is going to be spoken about. I don't know if anybody's coined it yet or, or trademarked it. But you it's, heard um, it here it's, first. Scott you Myers. heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> mid so we've got, I like it. Okay, it, 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 and this is what's um, what we're seeing, and, and it began a little bit last year, um, where some of these hedge funds, if you will, you know, they're operating like REITs, and they're and they're buying up portfolios of facilities, but they're buying them um, in in these markets um, and buying those facilities either from us or or from individual owners, and they're the Class B properties. They're not the Class A three story, you know, uh, gleaming facilities that are all temperature controlled and um, have all the bells and whistles, but 
you know, it's the more traditional self storage, maybe some uh, multi story, but there are conversions. And so they may have been older buildings and not in the prime locations in, in terms of a metropolitan statistical area and, and not even the prime part of town. Um, but they're doing very well and the economics um, um, make sense and they're very strong projects. And so people are carving out, you know, this niche in, in, in those mid markets of those types of facilities in those second tier cities that may not be, you know, they're on the outskirts of the major metropolitan statistical areas and even some uh, uh, third tier cities um, out in the more uh, rural areas. Um, not too rural, but um, buying up um, some of those properties that are in the path of progress and then um, creating a portfolio of like facilities that can be managed in a similar fashion and uh, gobbling those up with all the dollars that is funneling into our economy. So um, in, indeed, what we're, what we're seeing, again, a long-winded answer to your question in terms of uh, you know, the bigger investors getting involved is that, oh, all of a sudden, all, all eyeballs are on self-storage and say, wait a minute, the banks are offering the lowest interest rates of any asset class in real estate because they know that these things, you know, they, they have the lowest loan default rate. Um, big investors are putting their money in it. It's, you know, one of the safer bets, if not the safest bets, because it's the most profitable. So that, that obviously creates a whole lot of competition. Mm -hmm. That's actually a good point. I, ne I never thought of it this way, but would, I guess in, in my way of thinking, I, it's great mm -hmm. that I've got, I've got your ear. Could, could potentially the, um, the larger companies, like the large investors, uh, mm -hmm. institutional investors, like REITs and stuff, could they potentially be looked at as exit strategies for some, some of us? Yeah. Um, and, and I know you're asking that on behalf of everybody, Roel, because you know that's our business plan and that's exactly what um, um, we're looking to do. And, and you are as well, now that you're an owner. And that is eventually we get enough properties um, and, and they're attractive enough that when we bundle them up, then we're going to sell them off to a REIT, um, whether it's a large REIT or the mid REITs, because um, that's where the higher multiple is. Um, you know, the, the, the bigger the check that somebody can write, it usually means that they're going to pay a little higher multiple for that um, and then bring it into their fold. Uh, because then they can take advantage of the economies of scale and using their management, their platform, their marketing that is already in place. And so it's not always the case, but that, that is our goal is uh, to be able to eventually sell off um, to a, a REIT, uh, whether it's one facility that we, uh, that we build or convert or the portfolio of what we have and, and continue to package a lot of these projects up and uh, bundle them up and, and, and put them out into the market. So um, absolutely, that is um, business plan uh, exit strategy number one for us. Mm hmm. So there is still quite a bit of opportunity mm -hmm. to kind of slowly, quietly build your portfolio, one, two, three facilities mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. over time. Yep. And with all this money, I just feel like I've been talking to a few more traditional real estate <clears throat> investors as well. And, mm -hmm. and people who trade the markets, there's just all if with all this extra uh, currency being mm -hmm. dumped into mm -hmm. the general public. Mm -hmm you know, as well as I do, it starts to kind of gravitate to the fewer and fewer and move Correct. its way up that, that food mm -hmm. chain. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. one of those things is, is people who own assets mm -hmm. um, end up, if they're managing it properly, best practices that those assets end up increasing through, through market appreciation. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, with the best practices that, that we teach in our community, mm -hmm. what would you say would be uh, the, I guess the, the, the best value add play uh, with um, with existing facilities in terms mm -hmm. of the opportunity going, well, at least for this year. I, I think um, the main thing is, um, you know, when you buy, you should already be thinking about your exit strategy. And, and that's the, that encompasses a lot of things. Um, you know, so if you're buying a facility, uh, you find something that's been hanging out there for a long time um, and has a car wash on it as well. Well, that's probably the reason why it's been hanging out there for a long time. You know, people that are in the car wash business usually buy car washes and not storage. People in the storage businesses usually buy self-storage and not something with a car wash on it. And so if the pool of buyers is smaller, then I'm going to have um, less chance of selling it. And I'm also going to have to discount it um, as well. So I may not make as much as I want. But if you're buying something that is going to be very desirable in four or five years from now, after you Im have improved it, whether it's bare land or whether it's a, a self-storage facility that you're just going to turn around or whether it's a storage facility, you're going to turn around and you're going to build, you know, an additional 20,000 square feet on the land that is currently on the site or that you're going to buy next to it. Or if it's a big box retail that you're going to, you know, do a massive conversion on it and in five years sell it. Um, you should always be looking at who's my buyer and is it going to be attractive to them? Is there anything about this that is not going to get me top dollar and maximize that? Um, if I'm buying one acre of land and expecting to build something that a, a REIT's going to buy at a, at a high multiple, 
well, I'm not going to be able to put much storage on it. And so you can't get the economies of scale from a management standpoint or, or anything else from an operations standpoint. Um, that's probably not the best strategy. So always putting yourself and your project in the best light that says, you know, here's what the REITs are looking for. They want a population of X. They're looking for infill locations. You know, the, the rental rates in the market has to be strong. Um, we have to be, you know, close to perhaps, you know, good schools and close to a lake, you know, whatever that looks like. But, you know, the facility itself, um, 60,000 square foot or higher, you know, well, that's what the REITs want. They want a bigger uh, project. And then all of these other things, it can't be tucked back in an industrial part of town. It can't be on the middle of a farm field. Um, you know, we don't like to have one-way streets where you have to, it's boulevarded and you have to turn around and there's only one direction in which you can travel to get into the facility. You know, all those things that make it a little more difficult are essentially just not ideal. You know, if there's enough of those, uh, then we don't want to buy it. And if it ticks all the rest of the boxes, then, then it's just a math equation to figure out how much we can pay for it how much it'll cost to build value into it. And then ultimately, what do we feel that uh, is going to be the value in four or five years to be able to sell it? So again, pointing back to our consultants um, to do a feasibility study and then do our own underwriting on it to determine if it's a project worthy of uh, moving forward with or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, very, very cool insights on that. So the future is still mm -hmm. bright, really, considering uh, all the yeah. craziness that's going on. Mm-hmm. Well, craziness, as you know, uh, we live in the chaos and we are in the chaos business. And so, um, yeah, uh, uh, the, the chaos brings a lot of uh, activity for us. Awesome. Well, as always, Scott, a pleasure to get your insights on that. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad I was able to ask some of my personal questions on that as well. So that's mm -hmm. really awesome. My pleasure. All right. Thanks. Till next time. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll catch you next time uh, after your travels. All right. Thanks, Roel. We'll see you soon. Take care, Scott. All right. Bye now. Thanks again for joining us here at Self Storage Investing. We really, really appreciate it. For more great content like this, make sure to click the subscribe button below this video. And be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Bigger Pockets. You can also visit us at our main website at selfstorageinvesting.com, where you'll find even more free content our ebook and registration to our free webinars and education courses, and much, much more. Once again, for more great content like this, please click the subscribe button below. Thank you.